Hello everyone. Today I wanted to talk to you about the yamas. Yamas are practices of austerities. They are practices to help enhance your spiritual work. Yamas are the beginning practice of the Patanjali eight stage path of yoga. Yamas are first. They are the things to do to make and enhance your spiritual practice better. A lot of people need to come onto this planet with them already viable. For example, you'll come into this world, you'll already be kind and compassionate. You may already be understanding. You already may have control of a lot of your sexual desires and needs. You may not really experience much of that. It may be very much under control. But brahmacharya, which is what I'm going to talk about today, which is your controlling of the sexual energy, uh, utilizing that energy to enhance and embellish your spiritual development. As many of you know, I'm a householder. I never took vows of sannyasi or monk vows. A monk takes a vow that he will be celibate. And a lot of people think brahmacharya means celibacy. But I have to say to you, these things that were written were written for everyone, not just those that decide they're going to give up sex completely and be, live a month's life. You can live a householder's life and still control the sexual energy. And I'm gonna talk much more deeply about family life, having children, developing that life, and living that life spiritually. But, and, and, and definitely sex is a part of it. We need to have that in our lives as a householder to feel more fulfilled, to feel more connected, to feel more love between us and our spouse. We kind of need that in some ways. Uh, if you have a good, strong love relationship, you may find you don't need sex quite as much. It's kind of overrated, I think, in many ways. A lot of people think married couples are having sex a lot more often than they probably are. If you look at statistical research and things, they're not having sex that much. If you have sex once a week uh, or once a month, some people are only having it once a month. I mean, this is marital sex. Now, anyway, Brahmacharyan is a control of that energy, a manipulation of that energy a focus and a connection to that energy. I have to say as a householder, it's not really a good idea to become a celibate. If you're married, it's, that's kind of cruel, cruel thing to do to your spouse to say, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna become a celibate and live a celibate life. Unless your spouse is in agreement and will help you to make that happen. There are those that have done that. Um, it's something that can progress you on a spiritual path. And in time, as you move further down that path, you may want to become a celibate and live that part of that life uh, when you no longer need that in your marital relationships and you're in agreement to do something like that, you enhance and help each other to do something like that. But if you have a spouse, and let's say you started the celibate path, the celibate path, maybe your wife was in an agreement or the husband was in an agreement, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, they can't do it. They can't maintain it. They feel the need. And do you deny them? Do you still freely give it? 
I, you know, I think it's a cruel punishment to deny someone that sexual desire, that fulfillment that they feel when they join with you in a loving marital relation. I'm not talking about going out and having sex with women all over the place. I'm talking about a married couple now, living a, a spiritual life. It's different if you're single and you're going out and things. That's the, I'm not really addressing that here. I'm addressing more of a family life, a marital life, moving toward a spiritual life, and a householder. A householder has a family, a wife, children, and he moves toward that spiritual life. But there's always a focus on and around that sexual energy and that you share and care for each other with it. You don't hurt each other with it. You don't hurt others with it. You guard that energy. You value that energy. It's a great energy. And the thing is, is you don't misuse that energy. We need to see all those others in our lives as brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, so that it helps us to diminish the desires in our mind of lust and to move forward into a sexual relationship with someone. And a lot of people here are living in that chakra, in that sexual chakra. Uh, it's right there at the, at the genitals, your sexual chakra. And it's a powerful chakra. But all animals still have that open, widely open. It's probably one of the most abused chakras there is. Uh, there's all kinds of things connected with it. There's trafficking that goes on. There's lots of evil surrounding it. They use sex to sell things, advertise things. It's in your face all the time. It's hard to get rid of. You got people wearing very alluring outfits and things to attract you to them, male and female. And, you know, we put sex out there all the time. But from a spiritual aspect, it's something that you value and you nurture and you bring forward in a kind, compassionate, understanding manner. Not something that you use against other people. Not something that you use to manipulate people. People use sex all the time for all kinds of things. And what I'm saying to, to you from a spiritual householder standpoint, sex is not to be misused. It's not to be misused to sell things, advertise things, or do anything of that sort with it. And it's certainly not there to use as a punishment or manipulation of another individual at all. That's, that's not a good way of using your sexual energy. And so, I read a long time ago a book called The Gospel of Sri Ram Krishna. Sri Ram Krishna talked about some of the evils in the world. And some of the biggest evils in the world are money, and sex. And he talked about that throughout his whole entire gospel. And you really need to develop a nice practice in which sex is there as a householder, but you use it in a lovely fashion, a romantic fashion, a loving, kind, enhancement fashion. Because in the end, it's about the love of God and our love toward God. You don't want sex to get in the way of that. and You don't want any kind of manipulations or control or anything like that to get in the way of that. And you can do that with sex. I've seen it on both sides of the fence where men control women with it and women control men with it. It's very, very misused in our society. It's used... Advertisers use it all the time. They've mastered it. It's on TV all the time. It's in the news. It's in magazines. Sexy women modeling something. Sexy men. Even sexy children modeling something. The shows on TV enhance that sexuality. 
That's what people like to see. And the thing is, is the more you go down that road, the more difficult, difficult it can become to find the love of the Creator because you end up loving a body, lusting after a body, lusting after someone else, and then maybe you'll even marry that person and then discover, wow, I wasn't in love with them at all. I was just in love with the body. And you may not realize that right away. We're often attracted to somebody first through maybe a lustful look, but it's after we get to know someone that we develop love for them. You want to love the soul, not the body. And so love is an enhancement that comes into the heart from the heart. And this is what we want to embellish and bring out. And so how's that relate to the sexual aspect? Because I think people sometimes think sex and love is kind of a similar thing and it's not really. Sex is a, a, an act to bring about more generations of the species. And you feel the need for that all the time because of that. Now those, there have been religious groups out there that have decided to do celibacy. I know the Shakers were one of them. There's no Shakers left. There's no one here to practice it anymore. They practice celibacy together and they, they're gone. There's not a one of them left. They never brought any more generations in. So there's a danger of that as well. So, you know, the thing is, is you need to learn to do this from a householder standpoint. Because I am saying to you, you can embellish and build and grow a loving, kind, compassionate, wonderful relationship in your life and grow through it. You grow in love. You live in love. You enhance that love. You become kind, compassionate, understanding with your spouse. It's a growth, a growth process, an evolutionary process of the soul. Brahmacharya is a very, very powerful yama. A lot of people don't even talk about it in yoga studios. It's a difficult subject, I will say that. There's probably lots of opinions about it. But in the end, to find God, to discover God, to know God, all desires have to go. There can't be a desire left in the mind. They're all gone. All of them. There's no desires. However, if you're a householder, even if you move up to realization of the Lord himself, there's nothing wrong with continuing on with a marital sexual relationship. You can still do it. You can still do it. Will you reach the supreme? Yeah, you'll still reach the supreme. There's no time in the supreme. You'll reach them. Do good acts. Good deeds. Do something good for your spouse. Do something loving and kind for your spouse. Grow together. Nourish each other. Water and feed each other. Fertilize each other. Make yourselves grow and be happy together. And enhance that spiritual life through sexual growth. And realize that energy is a valuable energy. It's something to grow and learn and understand together and what it's about and how that relates to your own soul's evolution. It's something to look at and investigate all the time. All of these yamas take practice and work at. And I suggest picking one, one yama, one niyama, 
even one commandment of the ten. And working at it. Working at it so that you master that. I don't recommend brahmacharya for the householder. I've found sannyasis to have trouble with brahmacharya. They've taken the vows, the vows of celibacy, and they still go on off with a woman somewhere. Once you break the vow, well, you made that vow between you and God and then you break it. Well, what good's that? And I've seen it happen in, in a lot of yogic cultures, especially with a lot of American women and things joining some of these yoga-ish, I don't want to say cults, but yoga-ish groups. And then the guru that they're around or whatever, the next thing you know, they're off with him and having an affair. Well, if the guru took vows of celibacy because he's claiming to be a monk and then he broke them, he's no longer a monk. I was never took a vow of celibacy. I've always lived the life of a householder. And I am saying to you, from a householder to another householder, you can grow and live a fine life, a wonderful family life with children and a wife, and you can enhance each other's spiritual growth and life fabulously. I've been married 33 years, and we've had our ups and downs and troubles. I got very sick during it. We've always encouraged each other. We've always supported each other. We've always helped each other. Sure, we've had difficulties. Life is difficult enough as it is. It's nice to have a companion in life that can help you and make you feel less alone, make you feel like you're growing and doing something important and embellishing your life. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with growing a family. But it's also very important to grow spiritually inside. And that's what my channel's about. That's what I'm here to try to help you do. And I'm here to try to help you understand some of these more difficult practices. And celibacy is really not for the householder at all. I know those who have tried it. And it's, it's difficult. I know people have had a lot of trouble with it. Things still happen irregardless of that. You can still have activation of the entire shishuma, the entire track that leads all the way up through all the chakras, through the spine, from the base all the way to the top. That's known as the shishuma. And that energy still travels up through there. And you can get that energy irregardless of whether you become a celibate or not. I've experienced it. There'll be an energy that comes from above and an energy that comes from below, and they'll join each other. A lot of that is known as the opening of the 10th gate or the Kechiara Mudra. You can have all of that without ever doing any celibacy at all. And so I hope this gives you some insight as to brahmacharya, what it is, the practice of it. And as far as the practice in, in regards to the householder, it is not about being a celibate. It is about enhancing that energy, growing with that energy, and make it in, making it into a loving, kind, compassionate, understanding energy that moves right up through the body into the heart. If you're unable to open the heart, it's very difficult to find God, to find saints, to find helpers. You have to open that heart and work on the development of the heart. The heart chakra is probably one of the most valuable of them all. Because if you don't have love in your heart for the Supreme, you will miss him. He will never come and honor you if you do not love him. You're here to learn to love him. And once that love goes out, you will receive that love back. And that, my friends, I can guarantee you. But you must love deeply from the heart. 
and there can be no sexual desire energy in that. And so with that being said, namaste, jai bhagwan. I wish you a wonder, wonderful day, a very happy, happy life. May you gain some valuable insight about brahmacharya, sexual energy, and family life here from a spiritual aspect and from a householder aspect. May your days be blessed and may you see the light within yourself and within each other. And may you enhance your whole entire family through love.